I never thought when I was studying Taekwondo with Simon and Philip Ree <laughs> that, you know, I would ever use this in, in uh, television or, or, or motion pictures. Hey guys, welcome to my full interview with Lorenzo Lamas. We're going to talk about his martial arts history and background, the show Renegade, and so much more. If you want even more Lorenzo after this interview, of course, check out his book, Renegade at Heart. Amazing read. Linked in the description below. But before we get into the interview, I want to point out a great supplement company that helped me recently get in the best shape of my life. Check out my Instagram, Real Viking Samurai. You can see some cool pictures and videos of my recent beach vacation. But these products work. Click the link to find out more about First Form. I highly recommend that. In fact, I can actually help you guys get in the best shape of your lives too. Check out my new Facebook group. I can even be an advisor, but I want to do it through the app that this company has because it basically gives you all this information. You could calculate your calories, do all this, has great training programs, and I can advise you through it and even help you more. Anyway, click the link, find out more about that, join the Facebook group, and I'm actually going to help Tong Po, Muhammad Kisi, get back into fighting shape and have a potential match against none other than Don the Dragon Wilson. Regardless, it's great for anybody to get in the shape, whether it's me for a vacation, whether it's Muhammad for a potential match against Don Wilson, whether it's you because you wanna look amazing on the beach or just in your regular life when you get out of the shower. So anyway, click the link, check out the supplements, and if you want me to be your advisor, Download the app and choose Viking Samurai as your advisor. I just want to give Jeff Langton a special shout out for setting us up. He, he's connected me with a lot of really cool people that I ended up getting on the channel, like Benny Urquidez, and now I got you. So. Oh, that's great. Hey, it, Jeff might be watching this, so I want to give a shout out to you, brother. Thank you for making this happen, and uh, I hope you're well. You look great. I watched uh, your actual interview uh, with David, so uh, that was great to see you up there. And thank you for the props. Thanks for all the, the, the great you know, things that you said about working with me. I feel the same way about you, Jeff. You know, uh, I'm just talking to Jeff right now, David. Of course. I feel the same the same way about you, buddy. Uh, it was a pleasure to work with you. I would do Final Impact, uh, The Revenge, in, in a second. Tomorrow night, man, Neon Graveyard. I'll be there. To have you, to have you back on, uh, on the set with me, bro. So God bless you. All right? I mean it. And he's making his comeback. He had just had his open heart uh, surgery, replacing a couple of valves. And, you know, it was a success and he's looking and feeling good. So I think he's going to get back in the whole acting thing. So maybe you guys will do. Uh, he's a warrior. He's a, yeah. he's a warrior. So, yeah, we all wish yeah. him luck. Definitely. And, of course, he shared some very interesting things because he worked with all these great martial artists, including yourself. He's a master e Aido guy. And you know how hard that is to master Aido? Mm. That's what the live, live katana, you know, when you put it like an inch from someone's head, you know, that's what he did. And he studied with Japanese people, plus Hill Cho, Hill Cho, he studied with him, plus, you know, Lorenzo went to a, um, a military school. That's where he went to school and he learned how to box. You know, he knew how to wrestle. He knew, he knew how to grapple. Mm -hmm. Which is... Kind of what I wanted to talk to you about, because even though your autobiography is such a great, amazing book, you really don't talk about your martial arts history and training in there. Yeah, that that'll be another book, I think. Uh, oh, you're because, do another one? Okay. Because right. that just just my martial arts training in, in itself, I think I could fill a few pages. Uh, you know, it's such a, a has have had such a vast experience of different styles and, uh, you know, different teachers and, and so forth. No, but Renegade at Heart, that book uh, that you're holding there was basically a response to all of the press throughout the years that I've received, not as an actor, but just as a personality, as a public figure. And a lot of times it was really unfavorable. And I didn't respond at the time because I always felt, and my publicist at the time, uh, we both felt that to respond to negative press only perpetuates the negative. Mm. Um, you're just going to sound like, you know, you're, you're uh, just upset that somebody wrote something negative about you and, and you're responding and, and that this just feeds the fire. So mm. my, my, my past response when dealing with anything negative, whether it's press or just people in my life that are negative, I just don't give it energy. I just let it 
die mm-hmm. like a tennis ball on the other side of the court. Just let it bounce till it stops. Yeah. And nice. so this book was kind of my answer to all the years of things that have been said about me and nobody ever heard, you know, heard my side, you know, what I ex- actually experienced in, in those different events and, uh, and occurrences. So that's what that, it's a light read. It's not a heavy book. I didn't want it to be like uh, a book of revenge, you know, that's just not who I am. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so it's a lot about my, my parents. The book is a lot about my dad, who was also an actor, well-known actor. My mom was an actress as well. And it's kind of growing up a little bit, the book's about growing up in Hollywood and then, you know, getting my first, break in motion pictures and uh which was greece by the way the mm-hmm. first one with uh yeah. living it and john and and it was more of a personal book so the martial arts is gonna i'm gonna have to think about that and maybe start writing a treatment for that um for another book that i might that i might put out because i think you know when jeff and i were doing these movies in the 90s uh they were really pumping them out you know producers like uh uh, Rick Pepin and Joe Murphy over at uh, PM Entertainment. Um, you know they were Golden Globus. Mm. They were they were really putting out these uh, high octane action movies, and I feel very fortunate to have been a part of that. Uh, it, it wasn't my my intention starting out in the business was not to be a martial arts star. Mm-hmm. My intention was just to be a good actor. And uh, circumstances sometimes present themselves where you have opportunities to do different things that you didn't really think about, but it seemed to fit. And, and uh, that's the case with the martial arts that I did in the movies. It, I never thought when I was studying Taekwondo with Simon and Philip Ree <laughs> that you know, I would ever use this in, in uh, television or, or, or motion pictures, but uh, the timing was right. Oh, yeah, that was the time martial arts just exploded on the scene, especially in the 80s. I mean, I guess Bruce Lee really kind of kicked it mainstream with Enter the Dragon, of course. Uh, Let me ask, though, when did you actually start the martial arts training? Right. So I started uh, Taekwondo at an old Chuck Norris studio in Los Angeles on Wilshire Boulevard in La Jolla. And uh, it had just it had just been taken over by Jun Chong. Mm-hmm. Um, Korean master sensei, uh, and Jun, Mr. Chong, uh, had two instructors, two, two main, well, three actually that, that were helping him to, uh, teach. And it was, uh, Philip and Simon Reed. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Of course they're legendary from best of the best series. And Ken Nagiyama mm-hmm. and, and Philip and Simon, this was before you know, best of the best. It it was before all of their, you know, martial arts uh, motion pictures that they produced and starred in. Of course, you know, now they're they're legendary martial arts uh, uh, celebrities in their own right. But back in the day, this was 1979 uh, when I started and uh, they were just fantastic teachers. And uh, I I had, I studied judo, uh, at the YMCA as a youngster. Um, and then of course, like you said, just growing up and watching the Bruce Lee movies and the Chuck Norris movies and things like that. I, I really was, was, uh, really a fan of, of karate sure. and, and I wanted to learn it. And, uh, I was working as a, uh, physical trainer. I was, a uh, fitness instructor at a Jack Lane's health spa. Oh yeah. That's in the book. And you met a very interesting uh, coworker. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so when I was, I was working as an instructor at Jack Lane's and this dojo, uh, Jin Chong was right down the street from my work. So I would pass by it every day. Sometimes I'd pass by it and I would stop. I was on a motorcycle at the time. I just pull over, park my bike and just walk to the corner and sit there and just watch the class through the window, you know? And then one day I just walked in there and I met, uh, Master Chong, and I told him I'd like to start Taekwondo, and he said, well, great, here's, here's your gi, and uh, this is our, you know, you know, sign up for our, our lesson plan, 
and uh, I, I just got into it and I loved it. I, I went probably four or five times a week, you know? Oh, wow. Yeah, I went, I just, I went to karate all the time. And um, that's what started the whole thing, you know? And I worked out with a lot of people that became martial arts stars, like mm -hmm. Lauren Avedon. One of my students was Lorenzo Lamas. I mean, great guy, uh, really, really good athlete. And, and uh, Lauren was at Jim Chong for a long time. So was Sam Jones, Flash Gordon. He was oh, at wow. Jim Chong. Yeah, all kinds of stars over there. Yeah. I, I do want to ask you something about Lauren Avedon because somebody had mentioned this. I guess he was in an interview not that long ago and you guys were doing some self-defense video and you, you might have broke his nose or something? He took my nose and he put it over here and you know, broke my orbital bone here and whatever else. And, you know, my eye was, you know, was messed up. Right. So. Yeah, that was really that I, I have to say that I still feel horrible about that, that, that happened. Uh, you know, it was a zig when it should have been a zag and we were really close. Uh, you know, we had been, uh, practicing the techniques, you know, before they rolled the camera a lot of times. And I choreographed this thing for him. And I said, listen, miss me by a mile. But he didn't miss me by a mile. And uh, yeah, just um, I think he leaned in and, and it just was terrible. So <laughs> here's, and Lauren, if you're watching, I'm, I'm going through this, this whole scenario with you again right now. So I, yeah, it was a roundhouse kick. And, oh. uh, and I got him right in the bridge of the nose with my shin. Ooh. And um, immediately, like, swelling started. I didn't get knocked out. I'm very proud of the fact that I didn't lose consciousness. <laughs> and Mike Irwin was producing this for us. Mike Irwin was also a black belt through Jun Chong. Oh, wow. And Mike, Mike Irwin produced this movie, or not movie, the self-defense video. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and so Mike came running out immediately, you know, from behind the the monitor and he says, Lauren, Lauren, are you okay? And I go, I go, Mike, I think I, I, we made contact. I think I, I, I hurt Lauren. And Lauren goes, you broke my nose, dude. <laughs> <laughs> so Lorenzo called me after he busted my nose to go back to him uh, and said, and he was crying. He's like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm like, dude, just buy me some flowers. Come and visit me or something like that. No problem. He never did any of that. So I sued him. Um, what happened was I was really good friends with Stephen Hofflin. Stephen Hofflin was, uh, the number one plastic surgeon in Los Angeles. Okay. Uh, during the, uh, the late eighties. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, he, I used to go watch him do magic at the magic castle. So I knew him, uh, through the magic castle. And I also, I, I had his number. I mean, I, I was a personal friend of his. So I called him right away. I think he met Lauren in his office and uh, we took care of whatever it was. I needed to have my nose put back. That, you know, I mean, between my friendship with Stephen and, and, uh, and uh, hospital, whatever bills, you know, we took care of it. But I've never, I never hit anybody since before or after that in all the movies that i've done all the fight scenes that i choreographed on renegade all my movies never happened again so again lauren i'm so sorry that it happened to you bro uh, and i but, and i think all the yeah, he's, a, he's a handsome he's a handsome devil so i can't say that i ruined anything <laughs> no he's fine i needed to have my nose put back um so I guess all the actors and stuntmen you work with have to thank Lauren because I'm sure that experience and accident was like, okay, I got to make sure I'm like extra, extra cautious because I don't want to break another dude's nose. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe so. I mean, like Jeff said in your interview, he said, yeah. you know, of all the rehearsals that we did for that big fight in the neon graveyard, I never come close to hitting anybody. The guy would never hit you. You never had to think negative, like, oh, this guy's going to hit me. I have to worry about hitting me. He was always on mark. The guy, like, when we did that fight scene in the graveyard, he was there a couple hours before marking it all out. I didn't even know that. Oh. You know, so he, he, he takes that seriously. I'm always this far away from contact, you know, 
you have to be close. Yeah, but sure. in some shots, you can be like a foot away from, from the person. It depends on where you put the camera, right? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, on, on Renegade and Air America and all the movies that I've done, uh, the most contact is like a light tap, you know, just to the, to, the, to the stomach or something like that if I'm selling a kick. Yeah, sure. That's it. You know, and I've, I've gotten a lot of compliments over the years about the control that I had. Um, uh, just, you know, the thing with Lauren is really like, man, it, it eats me up inside. It really does. Yeah, well, I'm sorry to bring it up if that kind of brought you back there, but I needed to have my nose put back. It was interesting. The reason the guy actually wanted me to ask you is because of what Jeff said, how you're, you know, extra safe and, you know, probably the safest person to work with if you're going to fight him on screen. And then this guy's like, well, what about Lauren Avedon? I'm like, well, that, that could be an interesting story. I'm kind of curious to hear um, of your side of that. Yeah. But yeah, thanks for sharing. And sorry if that brought up bad memories for you. No, it, it, it's important to always emphasize, you know, uh, rehearsal at half speed mm -hmm. um, or even less sometimes, you know. I mean, because when you, when you choreograph a fight scene and you go to start rehearsing it, you know, for timing, um, everybody's tendency, not everybody, but most people's tendency is to speed everything up because mm -hmm. they want to get the technique right, you know, and they want it to look good. But I learned over the years that the technique on camera actually looks better if you consciously try to slow everything down. Mm -hmm. Just sell, sell the punch, sell the kick, you know, really sell it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, before, uh, like, for example, on Renegade, I was working with a lot of stunt stunt people that didn't have a lot of martial arts experience. Mm -hmm. This was like in the early nineties when I started Renegade and there weren't as many martial arts stunt, stunt men and, and women as there are today. They were all just starting out. Cynthia Rothrock was just starting out in her movie career mm -hmm. when I started Renegade. So there, there weren't a lot of trained martial arts that do stunts. So I was working with a lot of cowboys, a lot of guys that knew how to throw a wide John Wayne punch, you know, and fall off a horse. Yeah. You know? So I had to teach them how to go with the technique. You know, if I trapped an arm and put it in an arm bar, I had to tell them like, we're just going to do this really slow. Just go with the technique. Don't try to resist it. Cause that's when people can get hurt when they try to resist a technique. Like you have a wrist lock on somebody, they tense up when you put it on them, it's going to hurt versus if it's like when you're in class, you know, and you're doing, you're doing, you know, uh, just uh, one step punching your skills, right? Mm -hmm. You go with it. You go with the wrist lock. You go with the arm bar. You, you know, you get thrown. You relax when you're being thrown. You know, you hit the mat to break your fall. Things like that weren't really understood. So I found myself a lot of the time kind of teaching people how, how to take falls and how to, you know, sell, you know, a palm heel to the nose, you know? So it was an interesting period of time. And I think I really, really can say that I enjoyed the golden age of like, if you want to say like action movies, you know? Um, yeah, you were a big part of it. That That's basically what my channel is about. If you haven't noticed from the background and the reason why I interviewed Jeff Langton and of course, why I really wanted to interview you is because, uh, I got to say, when I was growing up, you know, I obviously had my influences like Sloan, uh, Van Damme. You were right up there because of Renegade as like, okay, this is like one of the coolest guys out there, riding motorcycles, uh, catching bad guys, doing karate. An outlaw hunting outlaws, a bounty hunter, a renegade. Such a cool guy. So literally, I wanted to be a bounty hunter when I grew up because of your show. Yeah, cool. <laughs> and That's a lot cool. of people like me especially in that that era, man. Um, yeah. You were one of those guys that like motivated us. Uh, speaking of which, I do want to ask you something about Renegade. And this is from another guy. He's got 40 years plus in martial arts. He's a president of an MC motorcycle club. And he's really happy that Renegade positively helped the image and profiling of bikers and wanted to ask you, did you put that in or was that more uh, the show head writer's idea that pushed that? So Stephen Cannell wrote the 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 story right Stephen Cannell is created Renegade was created by by Stephen Cannell who 
a lot of the, the people out there watching will know from a team wise guy, Sonny spoon, the greatest American hero with William cat. This was a very prolific writer. And, um, he wrote this, uh, this character, uh, Vince black or Reno Reigns, <clears throat> as, as kind of a, uh, an anti-hero, right? A reluctant hero. Uh, he was accused uh, for a crime that he didn't commit, but he couldn't, he couldn't get the evidence to clear his name. So he was on the run, basically an outlaw uh, that didn't know what else to do, except like chase other outlaws. Chase other outlaws, yeah, what a cool premise. So, <laughs> so it was a great premise. And, and uh, Stephen wrote the character, uh, with the Vincent Black Shadow motorcycle. So originally the idea was not using a Harley, a mm. modern Harley. It was to use a classic Vincent Black Shadow, beautiful motorcycle. One of the, I think one of the most iconic motorcycles ever manufactured. It's a prize motorcycle for the collector group, right? Yeah. And uh, when I first met with Steven at his office, uh, I asked him what he felt about about uh, about having a Harley instead of a Vincent Black Shadow. Shadow, and my my point was to Stephen. It was actually from a producer's point of view, which he could relate to. And I had produced a couple of movies up at that to that point. I said, you know, depending on an antique motorcycle to start every time for every scene is is going to be questionable, you know. Um, that was a kickstart motorcycle. The Vincent was a kickstart motorcycle, inline four cylinder. It would probably have to be maintained, you know, in a more than a modern motorcycle, mm -hmm. just because it's old. And I suggested to Stephen that they that that he think about using a Harley. And I had just bought that Renegade bike from Glendale Harley Davidson, like a month a month earlier from the meeting. And I had a picture of it in my wallet. And so I, I said, Steve, would you mind if I showed you a picture of the motorcycle that I just bought? He goes, sure. So I pulled the picture out. I showed him the, uh, the picture of it. He goes, oh, I like the flames on the tank. I go, yeah, it's a brand new Harley Davidson soft tail wide glide motorcycle. It looks classic, but it's modern. Like it has electric start. <laughs> It'll start every time. So when Reno has to get on his bike, you know, and and burn rubber out of there to, you know, because he's being shot at. Mm -hmm. You're not going to have him sit down the side of the road trying to start the bike with his with a kick. You know, he goes, <laughs> well, that's a good point. That's a good point. So that's how the Renegade bike got on the show. It was mine, personal, mm -hmm. personally, yeah. my, my personal bike. And then the martial arts, I also asked him in that same meeting. I said, so Reno's kind of handy, right? He's good with his with his fists, obviously, you know, he was a cop. Uh, he learned how to, you know, how to control, you know, the, the perps. I, what do you think about if I added some more theatrical martial arts, like Taekwondo? He goes, well, what's Taekwondo? I go, well, Taekwondo is a Korean martial art. It uses a lot of, a lot of kicking. Mm -hmm. I asked him, I said, did you see Billy Jack with Tom Laughlin? He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, I saw Billy Jack. I love that movie. I said, okay, well, that's Hapkido. Hapkido and Taekwondo, very similar. Um, same kinds of kicks. He goes, oh, you mean those wheel kicks? I go, yeah. He goes, you do that? I go, yeah. I've been training since like four years at that time mm -hmm. uh, in martial arts. Oh, no, wait. This, this oh, movie. more than that. This, yeah, was 90, this was 91. I met with Steven. So, yeah, 11 years, 12 years. Yeah, you, you've been doing it for a while. So, so he goes, yeah, I think that would be that would be pretty cool. I go, great. So in that meeting, we basically formed the the foundation for the character, right? Um, my hair wasn't that long at that point. Um, it was like just below the collar, maybe. He said, what do you think about letting your hair grow? I said, that's fine. I don't mind. He goes, yeah, I see that long hair, Harley, karate. Yeah. So what would you have a, like a, what kind of firearm would you have? Would you have a, a pistol or would you have like, I go, no, I said, Reno would have a shotgun. He goes, well, how, how are you going to shoot a shotgun 
from a motorcycle when you have two hands on the handlebars. I go, I'll figure that out. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was one thing that we did. We figured out that it had to be a it, it had to be a riot gun. You know, it had to be some like a like a, a, a shotgun, but with a short barrel and a pistol grip that he can just pull out of his saddlebag and <laughs> put it on the on the handlebar and you know fire away. So that was the basic of, basis of the uh, the character. It's so cool because basically you got that's like the perfect role for you because you got to have your two passions of motorcycles despite your dad really not liking you ride motorcycles, and then your your martial arts in that character is so cool and so memorable. A lot of people still watch that show uh, now, and I've I've been catching up on a few episodes on YouTube. People posted like entire episodes on YouTube. I recently watched the uh, the Muscle Beach one with Corey Everson. That was really yeah. cool. And I, I do want to ask you about another episode. There's an Aikido, Aikido themed episode called Black Wind. And they yeah. wanted to know how that came about because you, you guys pretty much devoted an entire episode to Aikido. Yeah, Rick Oki uh, was one of our writing producers on the show. And that was his script. He wrote uh, Black Wind. And I had trained in Aikido. Well, so my martial arts background is buried, okay? Um, I started in Taekwondo. I got up to red belt with uh, with heel cho, right? Then, uh, so I started with Jun Chong. I went to heel cho, got my red belt, and then got so busy working that I didn't have time to go back to the dojo and and finish up and get my my showdown and get my first my first degree. But I was living in Burbank at the time, and uh, this was just before I did the movie Night of the Warrior. I was training in a little dojo. Uh, by Al Thomas. Al Thomas developed a system. He was a Olymp 1964 Olympic judo champion with uh, another very famous martial arts teacher by the name of Ed Parker. Oh, okay, yeah, of course. American they were on the 64 judo team together. Mm -hmm. And Ed Parker and Al Thomas, when they, when they started their martial arts schools, Ed went Kempo, and Al Thomas developed his own system called Budo Jiu Jitsu, which was a combination of karate, you know, American, more Shotokan style. Mm -hmm. Kicks weren't very high, no spinning hicks, no spinning kicks, mostly a Shotokan style, right? Front kick, side kick, back kick, basics, right? Just chest and below, no, no real kicks to the head. But his, the Jiu Jitsu part of the karate was what was really interesting to me. And I went to him because my history in martial arts up to that point had been mostly kicking techniques mm -hmm. yeah, you know, sure. with Taekwondo. So I wanted to develop some sort of hand skill. And uh, Al Thomas was perfect. He, he taught uh, Riverside, Los, Ange Los Angeles sheriffs. Uh, a lot of the police department, a lot of law enforcement individuals went to Al Thomas for training because of his submission. Uh, mm -hmm. he, he did the judo portion, but he did mostly uh, arm bars, arm locks, controlling, uh, you know, uh, holds um, to the ground. And uh, that was of real interest to me. So I did that um, for a year. I got a black belt through Al, cool. through Sensei Thomas. And then I moved to Los Feliz. I bought a house in Los Feliz and there was an Aikido dojo like two blocks down. So I wanted to, to do that too. So I studied Aikido. I never got a belt in Aikido, but I trained there for probably a year or so. And just, you know, when I could, I would just yeah, sure. jump in the car and go down and get a class in. And uh, that really kind of brought me back to my judo training as, as, a, as a boy, right? Because, you know, you're just doing, you're doing the falls again, you're doing the rolls again, you're doing, you know, throws again, you know, the throws that I learned in judo were very similar to Aikido. And I just found it was a very well-rounded, you know, education that I was giving myself with all these different disciplines in martial arts. So when I got the script for Black Wind, I basically choreographed most of the martial arts fights, you know. Uh, Rick, um, Rick Avery came down and choreographed a fight with me and Marshall Teague. I think it was the second or third episode of Renegade, first season. But that was really the last time we used a professional stunt coordinator for these fights. I did all the other, I did them all. 
all, all the other ones after that because they didn't want to spend the money. <laughs> I could have used, I mean, I would, it would have been nice to have a, you know, a martial arts choreographer on staff, you know, so I could bounce ideas off of and we could really create this great stuff, but Renegade didn't have the budget. So I was the guy. So when black, when I read black wind, I saw this right away as an, as, as an Aikido story, you know, and how Reno goes back to a sensei that taught him, you know, his martial arts. We know Reno knows Taekwondo. We've seen it in, you know, 50 episodes, but let's see something unique for Reno. Let's see him, you know, work, um, getting off the line of attack, stepping side, right? Mm -hmm. Taking the, 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 uh, uh, the attack, neutralizing it, right? And then creating something beautiful to watch. And so, yeah, that was fun. That, so I choreographed that one uh, using basically just Aikido skills. You know, I mean, I think I threw a couple of kicks in there, but it was mostly just throwing and, and moving off the line of attack, things like that. My techniques have not changed. They have been expanded from beyond Shotokan to Aikido. Blending with the attacker's energy to deflect it. Yeah, that's really cool. Uh, there were a lot of really great episodes. I, I know that you had that two-parter, uh, the cage fight against Marty yeah. Cove, yeah. right? Who played your long-lost brother? Yeah, Marty Cove, cage fight. Yeah, that was uh, they did that two episodes in a row to kind of release it as a, I guess, a movie if they wanted to you know mm -hmm. i think they sold it in video uh, they sold it at blockbuster i know as a as a feature oh interesting yeah there's just part one and part two yeah oh okay because they did that twice that. they did it with cage fight and they did it uh another time with two other episodes i think um uh, uh gosh um who else was in that i forget but they did another two-parter uh before as well Hmm, interesting. Speaking of Aikido, have you ever met and or trained with Steven Seagal? No, never have. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. Have a lot of friends that a lot of friends that have worked with them, like Branscom. Branscom did a movie with Steven. Seagal. Oh yeah, Hard to Kill. I think he was in Hard to Kill. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a good fight scene they have. Yeah, Steven, I guess, doesn't have as much control over over his punches and kicks than one one would hope. Uh, yeah, I heard that too. Uh, there's stories, right, that's what I hear. I don't know. I never worked with him. I can't say for sure, but you could ask uh, Branson. <laughs> <laughs> She's still a loser. <laughs> I remember you. <laughs> um, oh, here's a question. Because there's a really cool picture of you and Jean-Claude Van Damme on the beach, right? So did, did you ever like train martial arts with them? Are you guys like close or did yeah, you get no. the origin of that picture? Yeah, that picture was, uh, we were doing a sports invitational. Uh, they did a lot of these things in the 90s where they would invite a bunch of celebrities to a ski resort or, or some tropical location. Uh, Paul Mitchell, John Paul DeJoria, the head of Paul Mitchell uh, and Patron Tequila, he would usually underwrite the expense of, of these things. And mm -hmm. Marjo Gortner, the actor, who was the uh, child evangelist. Um, do you know who Marjo Gortner is? No. Okay, so Marjo Gortner, folks out there would know would know him if they, if you saw the movie Earthquake. Um, Marjo plays the uh, National Guard guy that kind of tries to abduct that girl, and kind of has a kind of played a little creepy part in that movie Earthquake. But he's done a lot of other things as an actor. But he was a a, a tele evangelist when he was a when he was a kid, became an actor, and then became a promoter. A motion uh, like a sports promoter, and he would do these uh, these events um, all over the world. And uh, this event that that I met Jean Claude at, I believe, was in um, Estapa, Mexico, I think. And uh, so we went down there for a week of sports. They'd have jet ski races, they'd do tennis, golf, um, they'd have poker matches, and they televised all of this. You know. And they would usually have a speaker like uh, Robert F. Kennedy would come and speak about the Waterkeepers Alliance or some charity that it was benefiting. And uh, they would sell all these uh, 
these sports thing, the sports events that the celebrities were participating in to a, like Fox TV or something like that. Mm-hmm. So that was one of those things. And uh, yeah, so I, I raced John claude in, in the jet ski. Okay. And, uh, I thought I won, but he was one of the co-hosts. So at the awards <laughs> dinner, he got the first place trophy. So oh, yeah. <laughs> I guess yeah. it pays to know people. Oh um, yeah. Always. Yeah. That's but funny. he, he was, he was, he was a really fun, fun guy. I mean, we, I can't say we were close, but, uh, we hung out for a bit, smoked cigars and had some drinks. And, uh, he was married to Gladys Portuguese at the, at the time. And I was married to Kathleen Kinmont, Cheyenne on Renegade. Yeah, sure. Um, so the four of us uh, really enjoyed each other's company for a couple nights there. Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. And speaking of Van Damme and Seagull, you're kind of almost a cross between them in a way because you got like Seagull's height and you got, you know, the Aikido, but you got Van Damme's kicks too. Uh, so, and, and the physique, because you've always been like a really fit guy. I know in the book you talk a lot about swimming and obviously you do your martial arts. How much weight training did you do? Um, I, I did quite a bit, you know. I mean, they had me in a damn vest with no shirt on half the time. <laughs> so I, I really, I would, I would forego, you know, the craft service in the morning with the donuts and, you know, yeah, you have to, <laughs> I, just, I couldn't, I couldn't really do carbs when I was on the show. <laughs> um, yeah, I would say I probably trained every day. I did something every day, you know? Yeah. Um, you looked apart, so I don't doubt that kind of training was going on to maintain that physique. Like you said, you just had the, uh, you know, yeah. Also, I was also, I, you know, I was in my thirties. It was a lot easier to stay trim, you know, Sure. Back, back in those days. Hey, let's ask for people who are either discovering some of your movies for their first time or want to rediscover, what would be, you say your top three that you would recommend and why? Um, okay. So if you can find it, uh, there's a, a movie that I really liked to, to do co- that I liked sh- filming it. It was called The Rage. I played an FBI agent, mm-hmm. and it's with Roy Scheider and Gary Busey. Do I look like I need a psychological evaluation? Not at all. Oh wow! And, and it was really a really well well produced movie. I'd say it didn't have a lot of martial arts in it, but it's a it's a part that I'm proud of as an actor. Mm-hmm. Um. Also, Night of the Warrior, which I produced. On the streets of Los Angeles, everybody and everything has its price. Which I think uh, it has the most martial arts, I think, I, of any movie, really. Uh, I mean, I had fight scenes with James Liu, you know. Oh, wow, sure. It's fantastic. Rick Avery was the fight choreographer. So Rick and I, again... That's where we first met on that movie. And then I did Renegade years later. And then another funny story, when I went back to flight school to get my instructor rating to teach people how to fly helicopters back in 2014, he was my flight instructor that took me through the flight training to do oh, wow. to become an instructor. So that was that was just Rick Avery and I have this uh, you know, this this great friendship that goes through aviation, martial arts and movies and television so wow. yeah it's, it's it's he's a great guy and he's such a phenomenal athlete himself you know he's a master he's a master uh gold medal winner boxer wow in master class he's still i mean to this day i think he still holds a title in, in boxing masters uh in the state of california so wow. he, he's a badass he's a he's he's really a fighter yes um, so I'd say The Rage with, with uh, Roy Scheider, um, Night of the Warrior, which was with me and uh, James Liu, mm-hmm. and then um, Final Impact, I think was a good one. There you one. go, with Jeff Langdon, yeah. of course. And Mike yeah, Worth, and, too. And Mike Worth and uh, Jeff Langdon and, and uh, you know, Kathleen Kenmont is in that as well. Um, it was a good story. Rick Pepin and Joe Murphy wrote a really good story there. Yeah, that's a cool one. Definitely. I'm I'm very aware of that one, of course. And oh, oh, so you basically I didn't really know until I read this book, but it's kind of crazy. Like you raced cars, you did uh stand-up comedy. Yeah, I was a TV star, former 
heartthrob, <laughs> former homeowner. You did live plays, you know, because I think most people who watch the channel, again, because we're in this world of working out martial arts and action films, we know you as Renegade, we know you as, you know, Snake Eater and those kind of films, but you've literally done it all. You've even, you've even sang. You, you even had like a yeah. top song back in the day. It's crazy. Yeah, it, you, you know, you got to keep moving or somebody's going to hit you. <laughs> and I, the reason I bring all this up is like, I got to ask, is there anything that you still feel like you need to do that you haven't done? I mean, you've literally done everything. You're Batman. Yeah, yeah, I am Batman. I, I've, done a, I've, I've done a bit, but there's something that I really would, would love to do, and that would be to return to my acting roots. You know, I started out in the business as a dramatic actor mm -hmm. um, with Falcon Crest, right? And, and then with my martial arts and things, it kind of kind of got sidetracked. I went down the action road mm -hmm. and did a lot of action movies and things like that, which kind of, I guess it, it didn't, it didn't prevent me from getting work as a dramatic actor, but I was doing so many action movies that I think the industry forgot about me mm -hmm. as being, as being an actor, you know, but that's, that's who I am first, you know, I'm an actor first, I'm a racing driver, a pilot, a martial artist, you know, second. But my real love, my first love is reading a script, getting to know a character in the script that I want to portray, doing the work, whatever it is, the research that I have to do to learn more about that character, and then portray that on, 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 on camera and then see that up on the screen. That's my first love. So I think if I had anything that I'd like to do before I'm called up there uh, for the final judgment, it would be to get another chance at doing some quality dramatic roles. You know, maybe as an older, I'm older, so I would be like, I'd be the, the hero's dad, you know, mm -hmm. or I'd be a reluctant, uh, you know, uh, a guy that is just through extenuating cir circumstances has to overcome a tremendous amount of challenges to get to where he can he can succeed you know something that i can really sink my teeth into in in terms of a character i think that that's my that'd be great if i if i got a chance to do that again so i think that's my plan over the next few de years is uh I'll be able to stop flying because I'm flying full time now. So I'm, I'm. Yeah, you're a helicopter pilot taking people on tours, right? And every well, once in a while, tours, somebody recognizes tours. you. Like, hey, that's your renegade. It happens. <laughs> yeah, it happens sometimes. Renegade. Yeah, renegade. Where I played a shirtless, long haired, Harley riding bounty hunter. <laughs> An outlaw hunting outlaws. A renegade. Um, but yeah, it's been taking a lot of time in my life because I, I have to work full time. You know, I still got rent. I've still, you know, I've, I've still got to take care of my kids and things like that. So, um, but I think in a couple of years, I'll be able to slow down a little bit in the flying and, uh, and really focus more on getting out there and, and meeting some people and casting and maybe some producers and things like that and talk about getting back on film. Because uh, that's where I see, like, you know, I call it my last nine holes of my life. I see myself in front of the camera more. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I hope to see you get the show that you want. Uh, some people were asking, hey, you know, would you be interested in rebooting Renegade? Or, hey, how about Expendables 5? But it seems like you want to be more into... I've done the action thing. Uh, let's just kind of go more acting dramatic. Yeah, I mean... Here's an example of, of, an, of an older actor that can do both, Liam Neeson. Thank you. Perfect right? example, yeah. He can still kick butt when he needs to kick butt, but his character is always weighted in, in the reality of a good script, mm -hmm. you know? So it's not just, he don't, we, we don't see Liam Neeson just doing action movies just to kick ass. His character is rooted in, in in truth you know there's some truth of what his character is going through that's all i'm saying yeah that'd be perfect yeah.
That would be perfect. And just one last thing, because you've experienced so much and you do share quite, quite a bit in this book. Again, I recommend that to anybody watching this. Uh, can you share like the top three life lessons that you've, you know, you obviously have a lot of wisdom because you have all that experience with so many different things. Oh, wow. Um, I'd have to give that some thought. Um, well, my father told me when, when I was younger, I was probably in my twenties and he said, you know, think fast, but speak slowly. Because once you let the words come out of your mouth, they're there to sit forever. Mm -hmm. So choose your words carefully, but always be thinking ahead, you know? So, I mean, those are, I, I live, I try to live by those, those, those words, you know, and you know, another, another good principle that I've learned over time is to, you know, never say anything to anybody that you wouldn't want said about you. Just that's simple. It just keeps it so simple, you know, yeah. before you open your trap to say some stuff about somebody that did you wrong, just sit on that, man, count to five. Because those words, again, are out there in the universe forever. Mm -hmm. And uh, I do believe that there is karma. I believe in that tremendously. I also believe that there is a, a universal mind that's controlling the world, the universe, all the things that happen, good and bad in our life whether you want to call them God or Allah or whatever it is, it's a universal mind of power. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can harness that power as long as we have a, a good positive thought behind it. Right. So people say, well, you know, I, I pray at night. I say, okay, well, like, what do you, what do you pray for? Well, I pray that that person that, you know, stole my bike when I was 10 gets run over by a train. I go, oh, so that's like, you don't want to pray that way, you know? So we want, we want to think positive in our life. We want to create positive energy around us because like the law of attraction, the more we put out there positively, the more it comes back in the same fashion. You put negative stuff out, you're complaining about things every day of your life to your friends. That negative energy that you're putting out there is like a toxic poison. Big time. It's going to come back. Mm -hmm. So life has taught me that, what we put out, we get back, okay? What we say is there forever. Mm -hmm. And give a person the benefit of the doubt. What is it gonna cost to give a person that maybe uh, went against you, like maybe said something bad about you or something like, you don't know what, this person, what that person is going through in life. They could be going through a horrible time. They could have lost a family member. You know, it could have created such a turmoil in their, in their heart that they weren't really responsible for what they did or what they said. So I tend to give people a lot, a lot of the benefit of the doubt, you know, because I want to be treated that way. Oh, of course. Yeah. That's why I'm always so respectful to people in general, because I would appreciate getting that in return and it being reciprocal, but that's always my default. I'm always going to be nice. I'm always going to be respectful and then obviously everybody has their um you know level of okay uh this guy is just not my kind of guy i want you to be nice we have, we have a few everybody has a fuse yeah a fuse sure right? <laughs> so just let it let it burn let it we, there's a lot left just let it burn burn okay three times four times okay he messed he messed around with me twice okay that's enough <laughs> you know until it's time to not be nice <laughs> but I tend to have a, a longer fuse than most people, you know, and, and I think that it doesn't hurt. Doesn't nobody's going to call you a wimp or weak because you give a person a second, third, fourth chance, you know, in, in doing what's right. Yeah. Yeah. Great way to live. Just uh, mental health is going to be way better. I could tell you're a happy, optimistic guy. Just talking to you, spend this, uh, you know, 45 minutes or so. Yeah. And, I really appreciate, and I know the audience will, the whole interview, but especially that message and wisdom. So yes, everybody needs to watch that multiple times and hopefully live like you do. Well, I don't, I, I don't know anything. Uh, all, I know, <laughs> you know <a> lot. <laughs> all I know is, is my life experience and the lessons that I've learned. And, uh, and that's, that's what we're all here 
to experience our own lessons and our, our own, uh, you know, responsibilities. We all have them, you know, whether it's, uh, doing your homework, it, you know, if you're in school or whether it's taking care of, you know, a sick mom, if you're older, um, we're all, we're all given responsibilities and, uh, it's the way we handle them that makes us the people that we, we actually end up being. No. Yeah, exactly. Be like, be like Reno. <laughs> you know, I used to say to myself, what would Reno do in this, in this uh, circumstance? You know, because Stephen Cannell really wrote a tremendously noble character in Reno. You know, he really, really did. He wrote an amazing character. Uh, I looked up to Reno. I felt it was an honor to portray him on television. I really did. I, I, I looked up to him. I wished I was more like him in many ways. And that's why shows like that are so important. Characters like Reno, uh, characters that Van Damme had played in Lionheart, for example. You definitely got heart in Lionheart. Don't ever lose it because you never get back. It's like growing up and watching, you know, like these were the guys that we want to be like. And it's funny that you say you literally are the character and played the character where even you aspire to be more like yeah, that character. I absolutely, I absolutely did. He wrote a phenomenal character and uh, it was a pleasure to, to play him. You know? Yeah, absolutely. And again, that show holds up great. And I'll be continuing to watch more on YouTube because I've been catching up to a lot of these these episodes. So, yeah, Lorenzo, I know you got to run. I know you're you're a very busy guy and I do appreciate the time. This this interview was phenomenal once again. You know, I got to thank Jeff Langton, of course, for uh, setting this up. And this is a real treat for me and the fans. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it, David, very much. And I thank you and I thank your fans for watching. And uh, maybe I'll see you on the screen sometime soon.